This podcast is brought to you by Jupiter Medical Center, rated number one for quality, safety, and patient experience. Jupiter Medical Center is your choice for world-class healthcare. With state-of-the-art facilities and leading-edge technologies, their award-winning physicians provide the highest caliber of care for the community. Jupiter Medical Center is proud to announce the opening of the all-new Johnny and Terry Gray Surgical Institute featuring the latest in innovative surgical care. To learn more, visit them at jupitermed.com. Welcome back to another episode of the Palm Beach North Podcast brought to you by your friends at Jupiter Medical Center. My name is Noel Martinez, President and CEO of the Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce. And I am so excited to have my girl, Kate Ariza, here with us today. She is the President and CEO of the Cox Science Center and Aquarium in West Palm. Kate has an awesome story. She grew up in Jupiter, right? served in the U.S. Navy and is now leading the Science Center. We're so excited to have her on the show. Kate, welcome. Thanks. It's exciting to be here. I love hanging out with you. Yeah, it's just a great excuse for us to hang totally, out Totally, right? really. It's the best. So, Kate, I mentioned that you are from Jupiter. Yes. So let's talk about your background. So let's start yeah. with that. Grew up in Jupiter, right? Grew up in Jupiter, Jupiter Farms, actually. Loved growing up out there. But I mean, when I grew up in Jupiter Farms, it was not like the Jupiter Farms of today. Literally one road, Indian Town Road, was one lane going in, one lane going out. My dad actually started one of the first pharmacies in Jupiter, Jupiter Pharmacy. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. It's not even there. They When they expanded Indian Town Road, they took away all his parking, bought him out. And he was actually the head pharmacist at the Clock Tower Walgreens for almost 30 years before he passed away. And and so I have deep roots to Jupiter. Absolutely love it. Live in Jupiter now with my family. And there's no place in the world that I would rather be. We have it all in Jupiter. Yeah, you know, well, you know, what little secret. Kate and I are neighbors. We live like on the same street. Um, uh, he followed me there, I, by the way, if we're keeping <laughs> score, I moved in first. And then magically a couple of years later, Noel is down the street you're from me. You're bragging about the height. So I, I had to find know. it. I had yeah. to get in there. I so, told you it was awesome. <laughs> so you said, you mentioned your family. Let's talk about your family. You have two kids. Two kids. All right. Tell me about your kids. Two kids, 10 and 12. I have a 12 year old little girl, 12 going on 25. She's just wonderful. She goes to Independence Middle, which is awesome yep. because she can walk to school and a bunch of friends in the neighborhood. I mean, I think that's one of the great things about Jupiter and the neighborhood where we live in. There's so many families. It's wonderful. And the schools are great. I'm a public school kid myself. So it's in my heart, the public school system. And my 10 year old son, who's just a spitball, and you know, you've probably seen him out running in the streets, maybe almost. <laughs> almost getting hit by traffic, but they're <laughs> wonderful and uh, everyone is happy and healthy. And I think as a parent, that's all you can really ask for. Oh. My kids are happy and they're healthy. Yeah, totally. That's all you want. Yeah. That's and all, and you they, want. they've got to grow up to be good kids too. They've good people. Grow up that's to be all that good matters. Kids. Let's hope we're still working on that good kid part. So public great. school, public schools, you said you're public school girl. So Did she, you go to public school? I went to public school. I went to Jupiter Farms Elementary. Okay. And I went to Duncan Middle School, mm -hmm. and then I went to Dwyer High School. Go Dwyer, class Was ninety-eight. Dwyer, so the, out in the in in the farms. Yeah, you go so out in the farms, half the farms was zoned for Jupiter, and half the farms was zoned for Dwyer. And I grew up I'm West Farm, like I'm right next to Pratt and Whitney. That's where I grew up. Okay, that far out there, and that half I don't know if they still do it that way, but that half was bust to Dwyer. So that's where we went. All right. And then you ended Dwyer up- Dwyer was new back then, by the way. It was? It was a new high school. My sister was the first graduating class from Dwyer in 95. Oh, wow. Yeah. Your yeah. sister and I are the same age? Yes. So you only have one sibling? Just the one sister, yes. One sister. And what is she like? Is she like you? She is not nearly as cool as me, <laughs> but she's awesome. She's two years older than me. We are uh, really so much alike. When people- call us, like when our family calls us, they're like, they can't tell me and Megan apart. Our voices sound alike. We have the same mannerisms. She's great. She actually lives in Abacoa. So you can walk to her house from my house as well. And our kids are almost the same age. So it's just wonderful having that family all there, yeah. walking distance. It's it's wonderful. That's what it's all about. Yeah, it totally is. So you served in the US Navy. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's so did you go there right after high school? 
I didn't. I was, I went to the Naval Academy. Okay. So right after high school, I was recruited for swimming to the Naval Academy. And it just, I wanted to do that because I always wanted to kind of, the military was always appealing to me, being a part of something bigger, all that kind of service sacrifice. I know it sounds odd, but even as a teenager, I was like drawn to that, like giving back and all of that. So I got a chance to go to the Naval Academy, jumped on it, had a wonderful four years. Naval Academy is not for everyone. It's a service academy. So you're actually in the military as you're going through college. Okay. You graduate with, they have a ton of, it's a major STEM school. So you graduate, I got my um, degree in economics with a minor in engineering. And then you're off as an officer in the Navy. I served for almost seven years as an officer. And it was Incredible. Most of my time was in Asia and I just loved it. Weren't you in charge of like some, these big ships? I was. So when people were like, what did you do in the Navy? I was a surface warfare officer, a SWO. What is that? I know. Have that you seen sounds really cool. Okay. It's super cool. <laughs> Have you seen the movie on Apple TV, Greyhound with Tom Hanks? No. Okay. You need to go. All After right. This, I need to watch. You go. All right. Um, so it's, it basically, when you see these huge warships, mm -hmm. there's someone on the bridge of these ships going left full rudder, right full rudder, all ahead full, all back full. There's someone that literally is driving the ship on the bridge. That was what I did. Stop. Oh my God. It was awesome. How was big was awesome. this ship? It was like a carrier? So or no, I, I was never on carriers. Carriers, pilots are captains of carriers because there's so many, so many aircraft on them. I was on amphibious assault ships, amphibs. So I know you'll know when I say this, there's these huge ships and the belly of them is empty and the, and the well deck comes out. And then we load in all the Marines and all the LCAC. So it's like, this has this huge empty belly. We load in all the Marine detachments and then we would drive them to wherever they needed needed to go. Now, this was when I was in Okinawa. So the huge Marine base in Okinawa. So we'd go down to Okinawa, pick them up, drop them off wherever place we were fighting. And that was what we did. We drove the ships all around and it was amazing. Wow. Super cool. Well, so early on, did you have any, you know, role models that kind of steered you in that direction? Tell me about that. You know, I... My role models growing up were always athletes because I was a swimmer. So any type of swimmer. But this was like even before Michael Phelps. Like that's how old I am. Michael Phelps was like a baby when I, I was like. You're younger than me. You're not that old. Stop. <laughs> so I had, I mean, this is like the Janet Evans, Alexander Popoff. You probably don't even know. Mm -mm. But they're like, they were major swimming phenoms back in, this is like the 90s now. So they were always my role models. And then my mom was really the one that was like you can do anything like the military is not only for boys. Like I remember having this discussion with her and I'm like, the military is just like, is that just for boys? I don't know. Cause no one in my family was military. The only one. And she's just like, you can like, who cares? You can do it. And by this time, I mean, it was the Naval Academy was almost all male. There was not many females today. It's a quarter female, which is great. But back then there was not. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. My mom's right. I can't do it. So that was the end of it. What about role models? I mean, so so who was your role model? I mean, growing up. I, I mean, really, I would just say my parents were my role models. I didn't have, I mean, I have a huge extended family, but it was really my parents that were the driving force behind this and showing me that there's really nothing that myself and my sister could not do. Everything was open to us. And yeah, that was just it. All right. What about crazy moments? I'm sure there were some really, really crazy oh moments while you were serving in the Navy. Can you, can you think yeah. of one that was oh, like yeah. really, really sticks out? Yeah. We were in the South China sea being chased by a Chinese submarine, our, our ship. And they were kind of messing with us because that's what they kind of like to do. And we were um, messing you like what, just kind like of following you around, following us, like doing threatening things. I mean, we know like they weren't about to, you know, shoot at us or anything, but that's what they like to do to, I mean, this was when they were in a submarine and it was far more advanced than the ship that we were on. We were on an amphibious assault ship, which these amphibs, because you load in so many Marines and their whole detachments, they go incredibly slow. So when you're in the South China sea, you're a slow moving ship, warship, and you're being chased by this sleek Chinese submarine. Yeah, it was, it's a little unsettling. And they do that on purpose to like mess with our Navy. I mean, you hear about these, these kind of flybys and, you know, yeah, in places in the where they're not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yep, They do that all the time. And when, you know, I was the one that was driving the ship at the time. So it's like, oh, gee, you're, you're literally the, every life on that ship is in your <sighs> hands when you're driving the ship. We had, I think about 750 people on that ship at that time, because we did have a full Marine detachment on. And you're like, God, if I make 
fight, you know, come right five degrees. Is this, you know, torpedo? Are they going to torpedo us or something? I mean, we really knew that wasn't going to happen, but it was really unnerving being chased around by them for like a full day. They were like just shadowing us and chasing us. Oh, it's crazy. Lord. Yeah. That is dust. It's crazy. What about, so what, are there any moments that, is there anything you miss about serving in the Oh name? my God. Yes, I do. Like and I know, what? you know, I, I, it's one of the reasons why I'm so involved with veterans organizations now. You'll never find a group of people that you're closer with than the people that you served with. I mean, they've seen every side of you, the good, the bad, the ugly, the scared, the proud. My shipmates have seen that. And plus, when I was stationed in Asia, for every year, or I was there several years, but um, you're on deployment for about 11 months out of the year. So you're actually only home for about a month, give or take. You're on deployment. So when you're on deployment, you are with the same people. I mean, imagine everyone at your chamber, except you sleep with them, you live with them. Like you're you're all in the same, you know, you're like five feet apart for 11 months. I would love to do that with so, yeah. all my chamber members. I hope you so guys are all watching and listen. You grow very close to these people. They're like your brothers and sisters. <laughs> You, you will never experience that as a civilian. You won't. And it, and there's a cool camaraderie that you have with that that I really miss. Everyone misses. That's like every service member's thing. Or like when you get out and you're a civilian, you're like, had that camaraderie? It's so cool. Yeah, I bet. It's really, you, you don't really get that at all in the civilian world. That's really different. You know, I, I think of, you know, I played sports growing up. Right? Yeah. And I was always involved in team sports. And that's how I feel about a lot of my old teammates. Like you don't see them in many, many, many years. And all of a sudden you run into them again and you're like, hey, it's like you never really yeah, totally. skip the beat. So I, I kind of get it, but I can't imagine your life being on the line every day and, and being responsible for each other's lives, which yeah. is crazy. Yeah. What about, you know, transitioning back into civilian life? What was that like? Was that hard? Is it something that you struggled with? What made you come back to Palm Beach County? Yeah, so so great question. And it is hard. And I feel like I'm one of the lucky ones that was able to make a, a fairly smooth transition, get a job, you know, work my way up. I mean, I always knew I was going to come back to Palm Beach County because my family was here and I always knew that. And um, so coming back here, that was a no brainer. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to eventually, you know, raise my family here. But there are, you know, this was in, what, when did I get out? This was like 2009, 2010 era, and it was a, a depression here. I mean, a recession, not depression. There was a recession here. Jobs weren't easy to come by, you know, like it, it, things were tough by the, when I decided to get out of the military. And I decided to get out because I was at my halfway point. And, you know, it's fun when you're young, but when you really do think you want to start a family and all that, it's really difficult to do all that and to be underway on deployment for, you know, 10 or 11 months out of the year. So I was lucky. I, I used a head a headhunter. I got a job. Um, and then I started working at the Science Center not long after that. I've been there for almost 15 years. But it is for some people who have, you know, if you are actually in combat, in a hostile zone, if you're getting shot at, if you're, you know, in aircraft, anything like that, you really have PTSD and you struggle and that makes it even more difficult. I give all my respects. I was never in the ground getting shot at. I was never in the dirt. I was always on ships, which are relatively safe. Um, so I, I don't understand what these guys and girls have been through now that have, I mean, I've lost lo several friends, but still it's very different than actually being in the dirt in the sandbox getting shot at. Their transition is always harder. And I'm, this is one of the things that I, I'm really passionate about now is that um, they need more of a chance with their jobs. You know, to, their, their resume may look one way, but um, you know, they're dealing with things. And I think it's important that employers know that these are people that have sacrificed so much. They deserve an extra look. They deserve an extra chance. They don't deserve our pity. They deserve our understanding. They've earned that much. And it really bothers me when I see companies tout, we hire veterans, we hire vendors. And I know for a fact that they don't. So I've kind of made it my personal mission to help veterans and to help with employment and to be involved with organizations where I can raise money and, and help with that. Because it is a difficult, even for someone like me, it was a difficult transition. And I can't even imagine, you know, these, these um, service members that really are going through this and suffering with PTSD, it makes it, makes it even more difficult. So, so let's talk a little bit more about that, right? Um, you obviously you're involved in a lot of different things, but I know you're very passionate about the wounded veterans 
relief fund, yes. right? It's something that you're very, very passionate about. Why, and we're talking about this. Why is it so important for veterans to get out and get engaged in the community and get involved and network and, get, and just get out in the community and do things? Yeah, it's, it's easy for a veteran to stay in their cocoon, stay in their shell, feel sorry for themselves, especially if we've lost people that we know and that we love. It's really easy to fall into that. I mean, I know a lot of people don't realize this. Everything is more difficult for veterans. For example, the divorce rate is twice as high for veterans. Suicide rate, twice as high for veterans. Things like that. Normal civilians, yeah, it's still tough. People get divorces and there's suicide and things like that. But for veterans, it's that much harder. So it is important that they get out, join whatever um, you know resources are available to them. But I say on the on the flip side of that, I think it's even more important for our communities to help the veterans. And that's where I, you know, try and help and go and speak and talk about some of these things, because, you know, I think it's the duties of our community and the places that we live and the people that enjoy the freedoms that the veterans give to us. I mean, that's um, that's something that's a direct result of veterans that we wouldn't that we wouldn't have today. So I think it's important not only for them to get out and take advantage of these resources, but also for communities to understand, like do hold a veterans, you know, resource fair, things like that. I mean, yep. I know, you know, we know that um, Career Source does incredible things for yep. veterans and, and stuff like that. There's a lot more. There's a lot of veterans here in South Florida. Florida has one of I don't know. If Mike said this this morning, Florida has one of the highest veteran populations in the whole country. So um, it's important twofold for veterans to get out, but also for our communities owe it to our veterans to help with their, their transition as well. So let, let's kind of change it up a little bit. I want to talk about leadership. I think you are a natural born leader, a, a leader of wow. leaders, right? I've always felt that way about you. So if I asked you to describe your leadership style, you know, and how it's evolved with age, with experience. Yeah. What would you say? Uh, so right now I describe my leadership style as firm but fair, right? And that has evolved. First of all, no one ever described Kateritsa as chill. Like I'm not, I'm not a chill leader. I've never been chill. So that I think that comes with my military experience. But here's how it's evolved. When I got out of the military and I, I really started working at the Science Center almost 15 years ago now, um, I hadn't been through these life experiences yet. I, you know, I have gone through so much s since, uh, you know, my 15 years at the Science Center. And I bring that up because that helps me be such a better leader. I am an empathetic leader. I am an understanding leader. And the reason is because I have been through it. I, especially these last few years, I've really been through the ringer. And when my staff, you know, tells me this is what they're going through or this is, the, um, it is a matter of me being empathetic and understanding. And when I was in the military, I didn't have that perspective. I was, I mean, to be honest, I was a little a little bit harsh there for, um, for several years. Well, you kind of have to be, don't you? You kind of have to be. Yeah. But then for my first year, but the first year I was at the Science Center, I kind of carried that over and I realized very quickly that was not going to work. I needed to be a little bit more empathetic, a little bit more caring. And now, I mean, I, one of the things I'm most proud of is the um, all of my senior staff at the Science Center who work directly under me have been there for over a decade. And in a nonprofit, I know, as you know, the, the, that's a very transitory community. I'm really proud of the fact that we've been able to retain these incredible people. And I think it's because I work very hard on trying to cultivate my skills, my leadership skills to be more fair and firm, but also compassionate. You can't just be one without the other. And that's how my leadership has evolved. And um, and I think that's one of the things that my staff appreciates now. Now, again, I'm not like, eh, it does a time, doesn't matter. I'm not like that. But I am very fair. If you're getting your job done, if you know, if you're doing what we expect of you, like, cool. I don't, if you roll in, you know, I, I'm not at the time clock at nine o'clock in the morning. Like, that's just not me. I'm, uh, you know, so that's kind of how I lead. So you've won numerous awards. I tease you all the time. I was oh, like, yes. Kate, are you going to let anybody else win an award? No, I, mean, 40 I deserve all 40. of them. I mean, no one else should be winning. They're awards. all yours. Yes. You should be all yours. All right, yeah. but let's talk about this. South Florida Business Journal's 40 under 40. Sun Sentinel's top workplace professional, woman of worth, ESPN's veteran of the month, Palm Beach County's distinguished alumni award, and West Palm Beach 
West Palm Beach's hometown hero award. There's probably like West a Palm. million more. I'm telling you, she wants to win them all. I don't know who gave you that list, but there are more. We yeah, should I, add it on there. Yeah. Okay. God, so Noel. what are you most proud of? You've been recognized for so many different things. What are you really most proud of? I am as, as proud of everything that I've done at the Science Center. Um, I will always be proud of my work with veterans. Um, there is something about truly saving lives, saving people from homelessness, getting people new teeth so they can go on job interviews. Uh, that is something that in my soul, uh, I mean, it's like, you know, chicken soup for the soul with that. And the work that we've done at the Science Center is incredible. And we're about to break ground on a $100 million building. We're going to talk about all that next. It's incredible. But um, I don't think there'll ever be anything that can top my veterans work. And I'll always, as long as I have air in my lungs, I will always do it. And I will always support where I can. I, When it comes to um, service members and veterans, I kind of, I try not to say no when they ask me to speak, when they ask me to be on a committee or help anything, because that's, since I'm not in anymore, that's how I give back. Mm -hmm. And everybody should. All of us should be giving back in some capacity, whatever your passion is. I don't care if it's saving the cows or, you know, whatever. Just give back if you're passionate about it. I think that's something super cool about us as Americans. You can be helping whatever you believe in, whatever cause, like it's a free country and we should be giving back to whatever we believe in. Be passionate about something. I don't care what it is. I have my own beliefs. I don't care what it is, but just be passionate. I think that's what bothers me about some of today. Like if you just complain and you don't do anything about it, yeah. you know, some of the younger generation, get up and do something about it. I don't care what side you take, but just do something about it. Good. So that's- Rant over. No, good, good, good. No, rant on, girl. I get it. All right, so time to talk about Science Center. Yeah. A lot of awesome, amazing things going on. First of all, for people that don't know or have never been there, what is the Cox Science oh, Center? Oh, man. It's so cool. So I grew up going to the Science Center. You so, said that, right? You, I you mean, When you were a kid, you used to go. Uh, I mean, when I was eight years old, I slept under the planetarium with my Girl Scout troop. That. Like, and now they pay me to run the place. What a hoot. So, um... We believe it or not, we are the second busiest science center in the country, visitors per square foot. We're only 40,000 square feet right now. What are typical science centers? How big are they typically? So that we're considered a medium-sized science center. Okay. Large science centers are 100,000 square feet and over. So Smithsonian, Air and Space, things, those are large science centers. Um Mods down in Fort Lauderdale, I don't know if yeah. Orlando, those are medium sized science centers. That's who post expansion we are going to be. Um, typical like Orlando Science Center will be around the same size as that. Okay. So we knew, so we, we got this statistic, second busiest science center in the country. We knew we needed to expand. I mean, on busy days, it is elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder in there. So what we did was we did some, this was back in 2017, now I'm dating myself. 2017, we did a market research study, 18 months. Should we expand? Will people pay to come see us? What will people like? This, this um, survey, we used a nationwide firm and the survey was awesome. It was like, people will drive up to 75 miles to see you. They'll make a weekend out of it. They'll you know go to the science center, or go to the zoo. They'll see a show at the Kravis Center and all of that. So we knew that there was like a basis to expand. So we started working with an architect. We got these beautiful renderings. And around 2019, we started to shop it. Like we went to some of our donors and said, hey, would anyone be interested in this? And we were really getting some momentum, of course, and the world shut down early 2020. And we were like, oh my God, should we do this? Are people gonna wanna go to an indoor science center? And this was when like, we didn't know anything was gonna happen back then. And um, believe it or not, the Science Center did very well during COVID. Our demographic, people still, we moved all of our programming outside on our science trail, but like families with small children, they still wanted to come. And not only did they wanna come, they wanted our science lessons because the schools were still virtual, all of that stuff. So we actually did really, really well during the pandemic. And um, lo and behold, we got um, a donor that gave the initial 20 million, Howard Cox, now named the Cox, Cox Science, Science Center, Center. Aquarium. Yep. No relation to, or no affiliation with Cox uh, Media Group. Okay. Totally different um, philanthropist from the Boston area that was here part-time 
decided to be here um, more out of the year, wanted his name on something as a legacy, loved the fact that we serve so many underserved kids at the Science Center. That's what really drew him. Um, I mean, we see almost 300,000 students a year in addition to our um, visitors through the door. So you can't really deny the impact that the Science Center has. And I can say that with passion because I am a product of the product. Mm -hmm. The Science Center shaped my life when I was a little girl. So I know I can feel, I can talk to our donors and say like, hey, this this isn't something I'm just saying. We change lives. So um, the campaign quickly snowballed to a $100 million campaign. That's crazy money. That's where we're at now. We've raised $81 million. That's awesome. I can't even believe how this happened. In a little over a year and a half, we've raised $81 million. So shovels will be in the ground in April. We'll do a huge groundbreaking ceremony. We'll be under construction for two and a half years and we will open at the end of 2026. Okay. All right. So yeah. people that, so people understand, are you, are you, you're governed by a board of directors, right? Just like a chamber or any other nonprofit organization. There's a, the science center is a nonprofit organization. Yes. So the only difference is, and you know, I hate the, you know, I hate the term nonprofit. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause we run, <laughs> we had this conversation before yeah. we run as a business. You have to run. Yeah. We well, are a business. People are like, you're a nonprofit. Well, but no, we have a nonprofit I, status. Yeah. Non yeah. So we're tax exempt. Okay. So that's fine. But at the end of the day, I'm still a business and I still have to make money. Love it. So, um, we're a private nonprofit. So we do not get subsidies. We don't get, the only county money we get is we get TDC money from the bed tax, which mm -hmm. helps with our marketing. Um, but other than that, we do not get money. We, I like to say we eat what we kill. When you come and pay your ticket at the front, that is what I use to pay the light bill and I pay the staff. We are raising money for an endowment during this campaign. Um, so we have a board of trustees, board of directors, 30, per, 30 people. And these are incredibly generous, philanthropic people throughout the community. They pay annual dues to be on our board and they fundraise for us, whether it's time, treasure or talent, they're either out advocating for us. They are, in, uh, you know, introducing me to their friends that I can make a pitch to, or they're helping us get lectures or um, anything like that. So yes, obviously money is very important to us, but in other ways, our board is so generous to us, just inviting me to parties where I may be able to make connections or, or anything like that. So those are all my bosses. So I have 30 of them. They are very involved. So on any given day, my I'm getting 30 different directions from my bosses. But uh, all joking aside, they're wonderful philanthropic people. And I feel very lucky to have such an engaged board leading us to the next level. That's great. So I, I thought it was important for people to know that, right? I think people don't understand, you know, our situation, right? Because yeah. we're kind of in the same world, right? We kind of have the same thing going on. So what else goes on at the Science Center? Like, talk to me about events. Talk to me about what goes on at night sometimes. Yeah. Do the exhibits come alive at night? Like yeah, like do, night at the it, museum? Yeah. Do yeah. They? yeah. Does that um, really happen? <laughs> no? So we stay open on the last Friday, we stay open until 10 p.m. because people were like, we want to be in the Science Museum and Science Center after dark. Mm -hmm. We know the movie. Um, we, we love all that. So actually, the last Friday of the month, we stay open until 10 p.m. And we have our um, one of the things that we love to bring out at night, whether depending, is our um, observatory. We have one of the largest observatories in South Florida. So it's this huge telescope. I mean, bigger than this room that you can see, oh my God, we've seen the moons of Jupiter, Europa. We've seen the um, not only the rings of Saturn, but like you can see like the details of the rings of Saturn. It's so cool. So, I mean, and that's just one of the things, anything from what do we, what's happening at least once a month, we do a wedding. I mean, we are becoming a very, very popular. I didn't think about oh that. Oh my God. So many people get married hmm. in our aquarium or they get married in our planetarium or the observatory because they're like space people. We just had a Star Trek wedding. So like full Spock ears. So I was looking at the pictures because we always take pictures to like advertise. That's interesting. That probably I was mean, really cool. It was super cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're kind of an out of the box, much lower cost venue than some of the other ones. So that's our facility rental program. But we are doing anything from um, coral conservation to astronomy. We are still, you know, the premier place to come if you want to dissect a frog or do anything like that. But one of the biggest treks that have taken off is our um, technology track. So we do a lot with virtual reality, um, artificial intelligence. Now we're doing all of these classes, teaching about that, coding. We teach coding. I mean, when my daughter was five years old, she actually um, coded 
her programming to print, then 3D print a Cinderella shoe, which she still has. So um, my son in summer camp last summer, when he was nine, made his own video game from a program called Scratch. So like we are the building blocks of all of these, especially our tech programs, because I mean, the reality is in, when my children are going to get jobs 20 years from now or 15 years from now, their jobs are not even created yet. They're not even invented yet. So we as a science center always have to be cutting edge, forward thinking. Then, And when we're building this expansion, that is completely at the top of mind. Like we're not building, we're not putting exhibits in there. They're going to be cool on opening day. We're putting exhibits in there that are going to be cool and impactful for the next 20 years. And we're building them in such a way we'll be able to easily switch out when new technology comes that we haven't even thought of. The companies that we're working with to build these exhibits and design them, these are companies from all over the world that we've now contracted to work with us. And they like have ideas that I can't even believe we're going to be able to put in our science center, especially when it comes to the artificial intelligence and how we're going to tell that story and do it in a way that the, the families coming to the science center will be able to interact with artificial intelligence. It's just cool stuff. And um, so we're putting a lot of thought into that. And that is, you know, there's not one thing that our science center does. There's not one type of programming. It, there's so much that happens at the science center. Well, all that's education, right? Education, education, teaching, teaching, teaching. So what is, what role does the science center play in education? Yeah. So how we always, we work very closely with the school district. Course, and Mike, yeah. Mike Burke, I, you know, He's adore awesome, him, by the way. He's such the a great leader. He's so, he's so good. Yeah. Right. So the school district is the formal aspect of our science education in our county. We are the informal science aspect. We have the equipment. We have the um, the capabilities. We know that the teachers love coming to us because you can come to the science center and you can you can blow things up. You can three D print on the most state of the art three D printer. We have the capabilities to do what they don't have in the classroom, and that's why it's really important. We do Jupiter um, High School's medical program comes to us to do their advanced dissections. We do shark pig dissection is actually the most advanced because a pig heart is very complex. So we do that at the science center. So like we're shaping the future doctors that are going to cure cancer one day, or you know cure Alzheimer's or anything like that. We're we're getting that path started at the Science Center. So I'd like to think that we play a very important role, not the formal aspect, because Mike Burke and the school district do that very well. We're the informal side of it, where you come to get your hands dirty, because that's what the mind remembers, what the hands have touched. So that's kind of how we have this synergy with the school district and with science education in general. All right. So let's go. Let's look into the future, right? Um, What's the Science Center going to look like in 5, 10, oh, 15 years? Because you, you were talking about the future. So what's it going to look like? Dude, this new building is so super cool. What's so cool about it? Tell me about it. So what's it's 100,000 square feet. Okay. So it's big. Mm -hmm. Super big. Um, we use the architect is Harvard Jolly. And and Harvard Jolly, it's a, it's a local architect. It was, I, it was really important to me being local. We wanted to use local um, mm -hmm. companies to help us with this. So, um, I mean, you walk in. So let me just say, you walk into this new building and you're in the front lobby and it's a 5,000 square foot lobby. So it's the lobby in itself is huge. And you have, we're going to have a submersible hanging from the ceiling that Harbor Branch is giving to us. We're going to have a rocket engine that Aerojet Rocketdyne is supplying to us. We are going to have a great white shark that we're, um, that we're working on getting right now. We're going to have a model of Saturn hanging. So when you walk into the Science Center, you are just immersed in everything that the Science Center has to offer. I mean, the, we're going to have one of the largest aquariums in the state. And that will be when you walk into this lobby, you'll, you'll, you know, be bombarded with all of these cool, amazing things. And then right off to the right, we're going to have the Ken's Kennedy Griffin aquarium. And, um, this is one of the largest aquariums in the state that is going to be so amazing. Um, you start off, it's telling the story of water. So you start off in the Everglades, you take it around and it ends with a, um, almost a hundred thousand gallon tank. I mean, probably like the size of all these offices, a hundred thousand gallon tank that our marine biologists will get in. They will feed the sharks in real time. And we've already, we've purchased specialized scuba gear. So we'll have a docent in the sitting area asking questions from the audience to our marine biologists that are inside the tank feeding the shark real time. And we'll be able to facilitate conversations while they're feeding the sharks. I mean, how freaking yeah, cool awesome. is that, right? Hey, where else can you do that? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Where else can you do that? Where else can you do that? That, yeah. that you won't see that in Florida. You'll see that in California. There's a couple of places in California, but you will not see that in Florida. And the difference between just our, our aquarium is that, you know, aquariums in general are not very interactive. The aquariums are wonderful, but when you go to an aquarium, you go to look at the fish. Our aquarium is going to be completely interactive. We're going to have a shark and ray touch tank. You'll be able to pet the sharks. You'll be able to pet the stingrays. We'll, we'll have little fish sardines that you'll be able to feed the stingrays. Um, we will have co- and a beautiful coral display. We're working with um, the Reef Institute. So coral conservation will be a huge message in this. And we will have artificial coral and we'll have um, real coral and we'll have ways that you can identify. We'll have Caribbean coral and then we're going to have Pacific coral so you can see the difference in the corals. And we'll talk about what's happening right off the coast to our coral. So our aquarium, I mean, that's going to set us apart huge is that you'll go in there and you'll be able to play and you'll be able to touch and you'll be able to feel these things that you don't get to do in other aquariums. And that was specifically what the staff, we said, okay, if we're doing this, we're building this huge aquarium. We're going to do it right. We're going to do it right. Yep. Like we're not, you're not just going to go and look at things. Yeah, you are going to see things, but you're going to be able to touch them as well. Because in 10 years, your child is going to remember touching that shark and they're going to want to go out and do shark conservation when the declining shark species hits critical where we're almost on the verge of that right now. So like that's the method behind our madness. And that's why we try and do all of these things. Mm -hmm. So lobby aquarium. We're going to have a digital exhibit gallery, this huge 6,000 square foot room that will react to your temperature, that will react to your emotions. You'll be able to go in it's a 40 foot high um, ceiling and you'll be able to go in and launch a rocket 40 feet in the air. You'll be able to create your own animal. Um, that's It's called the Digital Exhibit Gallery. And the equipment that we're using in that right now that we're creating is actually not in any science center currently in the country. This will be brand new technology that we will have here in West Palm Beach. And that's only one gallery. We're using Steam Studio. We're integrating arts into... Um, into STEM. So we're going to have Steam Studio, which will have kinetic sculptures. We're going to have beautiful stained glass pictures in it. And everything will kind of have an art component into it. That's a large 6,000 square foot gallery. And one of my favorite new additions to the new building is a huge full-scale restaurant with full catering capabilities, because we do know that we will be one of the most popular facility rentals here in Palm Beach County. So we're going to have a a catering kitchen and um, full capabilities to do a 500 person gala, our own gala now we'll be able to have it catered on site. And that that'll make a difference when we're booking facility rentals. Are there plans somewhere where people could see this? Is there a website Everything where you could go on our website? Where? Let's love, talk about it. Here's your chance. Yeah. Say so, it up. so what's the website? Center.org. Okay. And under about us, you'll see capital campaign and our, everything that I've just discussed, including all the renderings is actually in, um, it says, I, I don't know, like campaign booklet or something. It's a PDF. Click on the PDF and you will see the beautiful renderings of everything I just discussed, including our marine biologist in the shark tank with her gear on. You'll see renderings of the digital exhibit gallery. And of course, you can contribute to our campaign if you'd like to. We love that. (laughs) But all of that is under our website. (laughs) All right. Yeah. So now let's go back to you a little bit. So talk to me. What what does it's got to be exhausting? Like you probably never stop. You're you've got to raise hundred million dollars. So what does a typical day look like for Kate Ariza? It's a good Other question. than waving to Noel when he's walking by <laughs> with his dog in the morning. Well, my day always starts with my priority and that's my kids. I am the one that does the drop off in the morning, that does the pickup, all of that. So the day starts with my kids, making sure they're up ready. Have you done your homework? Have you done this? You School is you know, the most important thing and my, my kids are the most important thing. So after mommy's duties are over, I get right, I mean, I, I don't have an opening in my schedule normally from 8.30 in the morning until 4.30 in the afternoon. And I'm, my schedule right now is booked out about three weeks in advance. So like literally if someone was like, can I have 15 minutes of your time? Sure, in three weeks, you can have 15 minutes of my time. Or when I'm in the car driving somewhere, that's when I catch up on a lot of my calls. Um, so it's busy because we are, it's the season here, as you know, in Palm mm-hmm. Beach. I need to take full advantage of this before season ends, which is just going to be a couple months from now. We're still trying to get the rest of this money raised. So everything that I'm doing right now is focused on my donors, Um, whether it's a board member who has said, hey, my friend wants to come by and maybe they know a person that might give a million or five million or anything like that. So that's that's been the priority. 
Now, secondary to that is we're about to go under construction in two months. So I have been making sure, and my chief operating officer, Carla Doheny, has been so wonderful doing this. We've been working really closely. I mean, our the front entrance to the Science Center, that's going to move. The parking lots, those are going to move. Logistically, things are going to get really that's ugly be, yeah. at the Science Center because the new building is being built on site. So we're building a new, we're staying open and operating and building a new facility in the parking lot of our front uh, basically, our front parking lot right now. That's where the new building is being built. Mm -hmm. So logistically is the other thing that we're focusing on right now. How are we going to operate? Where's the front entrance going to be? Where are people going to park? The road is being moved. The Drear Trail North, that whole road is being moved north. So like, so you're involved in every single one of those decisions? I'm involved in every single aspect of that. Every single decision. The, I mean, I, what I can, I delegate. But mm -hmm. because some of those decisions are so important right now, like making sure... I mean, I have to work with the city and I have to work with the mayor's staff, making sure they're all, it's a, it's a city park. Yep. So everything that I do, I've got to make sure the city is okay with, is on board with. And then I have the neighborhood association. We have a very involved neighborhood association. I'm, and I'm on the board of the neighborhood association. So um, I have to make sure every road closure, every construction, everything that we're doing is okay with them because- you know, the last thing I want is them picketing and saying, you didn't tell us about yeah, this. And you want to be a good neighbor. You want to be a good neighbor. neighbor. Yeah. And they're good neighbors to us. We want to be good neighbors. So um, I've been very involved with keeping the neighborhood association up to speed. That's why they asked me to be on the board two years ago so that they made sure that, you know, I was keeping everyone in the loop. Um, so all of that is really good. That's what we're doing right now. Hopefully, you know, we get under construction here in two months and maybe that'll ease up yep. a little bit. That's mm -hmm. what I'm hoping for. And then I can just kind of focus on the fundraising, making sure we get, you know, the money to, to get this thing to the finish line. But that's what a day looks like. And then at the end of the day, pick up the kids, go to soccer. My son just started lacrosse. So now my daughter does elite travel soccer. So every night she's at soccer. Now my son's doing lacrosse and I try and get some of my exercise in between there, whatever I can. Um, and by the end of the day, I'm You're dead. tired. And You're to dead. make it worse, <laughs> and I haven't even told you, we got a puppy over the weekend. Oh, Lord. I know. You can borrow know. mine I'm anytime just, you want. I'm just like, why did we do this? But we we adopted the cutest little puppy over the weekend. What kind of dog? She's a Pekingese. Okay. And, right. um, and she's just adorable, but she's a 12 week puppy. And yeah, like lot. last night I was up like five times just yeah, that's letting her out. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I don't know, glutton for punishment, I guess, but oh. everything that I do, I feel like, you know, there's a purpose to it and that's, that's why I do it all. So let's talk about that. So you've, you've been serving your whole life. Yeah. What does service mean to you? Yeah. You know, I get asked that a lot because even when I was like eight, nine years old, I was volunteering at my church, which was St. Ignatius, right? In Mommy's Gardens. I was, you know, I, re I remember helping set up with the Christmas parties for the kids. And I remember helping with all of that service. Like my, like I feel complete when I'm helping others. And I don't mean that like helping, like passing out food or anything like that, like just helping in some capacity, whether it is, I, I used to walk dogs at the animal care and control building off Belvedere. I used to like help with that because I felt, I felt sorry for the dogs. And so that is when I kind of feel complete. And it's because I have been afforded so many incredible things in this country that we live in. And I feel that, um, and I, I mean, I feel it in my bones. And that's why, one of the reasons why I wanted to go, to join the military. One of the reasons why I wanted to go to the Naval Academy. And even now, you know, yes, I, I, you know, I run the Science Center and we do a, we do incredible work for our community. But on a personal level, I always feel like I can do more. And that's what service means to me, like doing more because I can. There are people that can't. And I understand that. I get that. But I can. So I should. It's a great Great answer. That was really, really good. Oh, okay. I love it. I love it. Unless you want to keep going, but that was really, really, really good. All right. Last question, because yeah. I could be here all day yeah. with you, Kate. All right. There are a lot of women, men that look up to you, right? Because like I mentioned earlier, you are a true leader. Oh, gosh. What would kind of, kind of advice would you give someone that is up and coming and wants to be Kate Ariza one day? I always have a first piece of advice, which I wish I had to learn this the hard way. I wish someone did tell me this. And if you 
want to be a leader or if you want to anything, it just, it doesn't matter, leader of your household, leader of the country, you have got to be an effective communicator. And my advice that I always give is Toastmasters. I did Toastmasters for three years when I was just starting out. You learn how to speak. You learn how many times you say, um, you learn, um, I was in competitions all around the county and there, you know, there's things, tabletop is it's rapid fire. It's long speeches. I cannot recommend Toastmasters highly enough. And there are Toastmasters, there's Jupiter, West Palm, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. These groups you meet during lunch or you meet at evening and it teaches you how to speak effectively because I don't care who you are. If you're, if you aren't an effective communicator, you really won't be an effective leader. Not just in in career wise, but in in life. In life, in completely in yeah. life. Mm-hmm. So that's the number one piece of advice I give, and that's like super easy. And I wish someone had told me that when I decided I I wanted to you know to be president CEO. I kind of had to learn it the hard way. Like flubbed a bunch of speeches, and I was like, okay, I need some help here. And then I went to Toastmasters and was like, God, these people, there is, there's a method to this. There is a way that you prepare speeches. There's a way that you're an effective speaker and that's what they teach you. And I'm so uh, passionate about the fact that you really can't, whether it is in your family or the country, you cannot be an effective leader without good communication skills. Well, great advice. Yeah. That's really, really good advice. Anything that we've missed about the Science Center that you want to make sure our listeners hear before we go? Yes, the Science Center is awesome (laughs) right now. So let me just tell you what we have right now. Um, You know, we have traveling exhibits that rotate every six months. So right now we have the Titanic exhibit, which is so super cool. Yeah, that's gotta be cool. Yeah, that's gotta be really cool. Awesome. I mean, Mm -hmm. actual artifacts from the ship itself are in the Science Center right now. You can actually be staring at them. Super cool. That's there until the end of April. And then we bring in dinosaurs this summer. Dinosaurs are always a huge hit. So we'll have a dinosaur exhibit in the summer. And then in the fall, we bring in the Jurassic Park animatronic dinosaurs, the huge dinosaurs that are sensor activated. So when you walk by them, they growl, they spit at you. They do all these things. They're Pretty scary for the little kids, but we love it. So we have an incredible lineup at the Science Center. So even though we're going under construction, we have incredible blockbuster exhibits that will still be there. We're still open and operating. We'll have our regular program. And we hope that people definitely come to see us because there's there's going to be even more to offer. We're going to, once we get under construction, we're going to make an exhibit out of the some of the construction that they're doing. And we're working with the construction company right. for like on virtual reality type exhibits. You'll be able to like see what the new building is going to look like and all of that stuff. So we'll never stop. We can't stop. And the new facility will open in 2026. And we hope to see you all there. All right. Website. One more time. CoxScienceCenter.org. All right. Great, great, great. Well, Kate, Thank you so much Thanks. for being here today. You were awesome. Well, I could've, appreciate it. Thank could have been here all day long. For everyone listening at home, thank you again. So um, thank you so much for uh, tuning in. Please make sure to like, follow, share. Tell everybody about all the great things going on in Palm Beach North. We look forward to seeing you guys in two weeks. See you soon. <laughs>